Hello, and welcome to another Book Thoughts. Haven't done one of these in a while, but I just finished a really good book, In the Shadow of Lightning, by Brian McClellan. Brian McClellan most famously wrote the uh, Powder Mage trilogy and then the follow-on Gods of Blood and Powder trilogy. I enjoyed both of those very much. There's a lot of things that carry through from there. It's a completely new setting. It's a completely different cast, all of that. But, you know, very much the same author. I think he's grown in some ways. And I think um, you can see some through lines in his writing style. But let's let's start off from the top. So this is a fantasy setting. It starts off fairly low fantasy, but then, well, I don't know if you'd call it low fantasy. I'll, I'll describe the situation and you can decide for yourself. Human civilization is built upon a substance called god glass. God glass is truly a type of glass, a special glass that is made, and there are many varieties, and they have magical abilities. If you have, you know, if you put, if you have contact with forge glass, you become stronger and faster. If you have contact with um, wit glass, you be able, you're able to think more clearly and more quickly, and, you know, um, blades are made of razor glass, and so on and so on. All the regular things that we're used to also exist, and I should say that the technology, again, is a probably late 1700s, you know, like, think like American Revolution, got guys fighting with muskets and grenades, but also bayonets and swords and something in that area, uh, which I think um, is just fantastic for, um, for, for fantasy. It really is a underserved time period, and there's a lot that you can do there. And this does a lot that's very different than with Powder Mage. So that's that's the magic. That's one part of the magic. The other part of the magic is glass dancing. Glass dancing can be done by glass dancers who are born magic, and they have the ability to mentally manipulate glass, kind of like Magneto powers, but with glass. They can pull it in, turn it into shards, attack with it. Now, it seems that they need bigger pe they can only concentrate on so many pieces of glass at once. So like if you smash up glass into powder, they can't like manipulate it and they can't seem to fuse glass back together. But other than that, they take the glass and they whip it around and they're, you know, for massive casualties and all of that. It's a good time. So, that's the that's the magic of the setting. The, like, history politics of the setting is that we are in a empire that is a, um, a merchant empire. There are leading families, and they run things, and there are minor families that, you know, nip at the heels, and then there's the rest of the people who have no real say. It's a little more... I don't, I don't know if I want to call it Renaissance Italy or if I want to call it Dutch or what, but it, it is a very different system than like you would see in Powder Mage or Blood and Powder. Very different politics, very different society. The society and the magic, they really mutually reinforce. You see how God, uh, how God Glass shows up in everyday scenarios. There's cheap junk god glass that's used for laborers and the really expensive stuff is only used for the really good folks, you know, really rich folks and powerful folks, and so on and so on. We have four characters, and they are um, Demir. Demir is a scion of a minor but notable guild house. Those are the powerful families. They're called guild houses who in the prologue has a mental break and runs away for nine years. You have his childhood best friend, Kizzy. She is the bastard of a, of the most powerful guild house. So she gets scut jobs, has minor leeway and, um, was, you know, Demir's childhood best friend, even though they're connected to different guild houses that are all guild houses are in competition. There are no alliances. You have uh, Kessa, Kessie, something along those lines, um, 
who is a maker of God Glass, the chief uh, chief journeyman to one of the world's great masters. And you have... What's his name now? Idrian. And he is... So the thing about God Glass is you can't use too much of it or your body starts to break down, basically. It gets more involved in that, but that's the idea. Permanent damage to your body from using too much of it. For most people, that's not a lot. But he's one of these special people called a glazier who can load up with a ton of god glass. So he's in the army and he's loaded up with this god glass armor that makes him basically a whole, just like, he's just a superhero. He's a one-man army, right? Um, and both, all sides have these one-man armies. So, you know. Um, and so those are our four, our four people. Um, the action kicks off when Demir finds out that his mother, the matriarch of their tiny little guild family and the only politically involved member of his family left, um, has been killed and has been killed by four, uh, no, I'm sorry. Six assassins. It's been killed by six assassins. And it's a big cabal. It's a big mystery. Demir rushes back to the capital, where he comes back in contact with his friend Kizzy, the enforcer, who's the bastard child, hires her on. He gets and needs help with the army. Um, and so he ends up getting getting connected with Demir. No, I'm sorry, not Demir. Idrian. The names. So many names. And then finally, the glass-making lady gets involved because the woman who was killed to, to start the action um, was working with her master on a secret project. And she is then, you know, drawn into all of this, too. This all takes place on the against the backdrop of war, on the, against the backdrop of... Uh, intense inter-guild politics and a, against the backdrop of some minor magical-y things happening. Now, I was willing to call it, or I was, I, my instinct was to call it low fantasy because we have some magic, so it is fantasy, but we don't really have anything fantastical. We have a set of rules. The magic is very rules-based, very, very rules-based, very solid system. Again, I say that you can really see the effects of Sanderson being this guy's mentor. But it's it's not really, you know, fantastical, right? That starts to get chipped away at the edges uh, as you go through the book. Something more is going on. Something perhaps a little more fantastical. I, that's all I'll say about it. Um, but... That is what it is. Now that we've laid out the basics of the story and we've laid out the basics of the world, I want to talk about, is it good? And my answer is a resounding yes. It is very good. Um, so the things I want, to, I want to really put focus on here are the characters. These characters are fantastic. They're flawed. I don't think anyone got into bouts of self-pity which has happened before in um, McClellan's books, and I find off-putting. There were no bouts of self-pity. There were doubts. There were moments where they weren't sure they were going to be able to make it, but then they rallied, and 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 they pushed through. The um, the way the magic was used was very clever. It was manipulated in very interesting ways. The way the okay, so the politics were there. They were there, and they intensely filled the background, but we weren't really playing... This wasn't a political thriller, right? It wasn't about careful manipulation of the levers of power. Um, it was a, more like there's this delicate political tapestry in the background, and our main characters just go, cut, slice, go right through, um, in entertaining ways. There, you know, for the first half of the book, so the, the previous series, you know, the, the Powder Mage world, very clearly is two-thirds milfic, you know, military fiction. 
Um, that's not the case for this, though we do have a soldier, but he's like a superhero for most of the time, right? He's jumping off of roofs and, and you know, stuff like that. Um, but we actually, we do have some milfic bleed through. I thought it was very good. I thought the battles were very well written. The milfic, you know, the, the large scale battles were very well written, very well thought out, and um, very, a, a pleasure to read for me. I, it might not be your thing, but it was a pleasure for me to read those. The skullduggery that happened, there was a lot of skullduggery in this book. Very fun to read. Again, it was more fun than complex. It had the complexity it needed for the story it was trying to tell, but it wasn't reveling in its own complexity. I think there's a place for that sometimes, but this is not, this was not it, and I think it really benefited from that. Three storylines, or I'm sorry, four storylines. The four storylines, you can see how they connect very early, and even though they don't necessarily tie into each other perfectly super fast, you you feel those threads slowly tighten, right? I think the pacing was very nice on that. I think that as a narrative experience, the cadence of the book was pretty good. The first 100 or 200 pages were laying things out, were interesting, were engaging, but then once you got to probably about 200 pages in, it it really started picking up speed going downhill. You know, um, once you had a firm footing in the world and the magic, then then it could start really get going um, and just, just keep up that building of pace all the way to the end. Um, I mean, literally, all the way through the epilogue. It just, the you know, you're just like, what, what, what? It's It's good. And really, the highest praise I can give this book right now is that I want to read the next one right now. I don't want to wait. I want to I want to be able to dive right into the next book. I don't need a break. I don't need nothing. I I need more of more of the series. And I mean that's that's high praise. I got a lot of books to choose from. For me to want to go to immediately to the next one means that I really like it. And uh I can't because it hasn't been published yet. So I'm waiting impatiently for the next one, even though I just finished this right now. So that's my main thoughts on this. Um, the characters were great. The story was great. The world was great. Uh, there's some things in here that might not be to your taste. If you don't like mill fiction, if you are looking for, which isn't the focus, but if you really have a distaste for it, if you don't like um, the fact that it's not, you know, High fantastical, that that might not be for you, but I think that overall, otherwise, it should be relatively um, relatively wide appeal, is what I'll say. Uh, there is a smidge of romance, kind of, not too much. There's um, excellent secondary characters, and. Really, I think that the next book, this has set up plots that the next book are going to just, just, it's going to reap the benefits. So that's what I have here for this book. Full recommendation, two thumbs way up. I really suggest you go out there and read it. Subscribe if you want to see more from me, whether it's games or more book thoughts or what have you. Comment. What do you think about this book? Was this review helpful to you at all? And uh, yeah, like, because then other people will actually see the book or see this, see this video and then maybe go and buy the book or read the book at the library. You do you. Anyway, don't pirate. That's the one thing don't do. Don't pirate. That's what I got. And I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>